Hi everybody. Greetings from a blistering hot Cape Town this morning. Oh, it's still early in the day. But the heat is oppressive and sweltering. Oh, I just hope as we uh, proceed with this video that we don't get to a point where you start seeing perspiration falling from our forehead. At any rate, uh, a couple of weeks ago we started um, moving through a list of questions that our subscribers had put to us. And we've made uh, some progress, we haven't got to the end of it, and I'm hoping that perhaps this morning we can try and tackle most, if not all, of the outstanding questions. Monday I'm back at work, so it's going to be busy, and uh, the time's going to be a problem again. So let's make hay while the sun shines, and uh, get stuck right in without any further ado. Okay, let's begin with this question. I was wondering what was the frequency and duration of call-ups and how many years of service were required? Well, <clears throat> uh, let me try and answer it like this. Uh, when a young lad in Rhodesia started high school, he would then be exposed to, to military service in the form of cadets. And this was compulsory and uh, he would have to attend it would be different days at different schools. At the school I attended, it was Friday afternoons. And um, a boy, as I said, of my generation, of uh, 13, 14 years old, would be expected to be fully conversant with the um, standard British uh, weapons of the time. The uh, Lee Enfield, SMLE, certainly. Uh, he would know the parts, he would know how to strip it, he would know how to clean it, he would know how to march with it. Uh, and, and this would be from a very, very, very young age. Um, once he finished schooling, very soon after he would be called up for compulsory um, peacetime training. And this would be down at the depot of the Royal Rhodesia Regiment, as it was known then. And that would be, in my case, it would have been a period of four and a half months. And this would be, be divided into three phases. So the first phase uh, would be just, you know, basic um, soldiering. Uh, how to march, how to salute, or, you know, how to shoot. Um, all the sort of stuff that every soldier, regardless of what branch of the service he might end up in one day, uh, ought to be proficient in. So you then move on into your second phase, uh, which would be um, quite different if they have happened to post you to, to another unit. Uh, in my case, I went to a specialist company and trained uh, in armored cars, as I said on, in the last video. So for my second and third phase, uh, that's what I did. Other folk may have been sent to artillery, some to signals, um, some to the regimental police. Others would have stayed soldiers. Um, you know, it all depends on circumstances there. Uh, however, when your four and a half months uh, service was over, you would then be posted to, um, shall I say, a frontline battalion in your hometown. Uh, in my case, it would have been to the 1st Battalion Royal Rhodesia Regiment. I think if you came from Bulawayo, you would have gone to the 2nd Battalion. Um, and then you would serve a certain amount of time there. It was a number of years. Uh, which involved um, weekend um, parades where you'd be gone for a weekend maybe. Sometimes it would just be a, a, a day on a Saturday and uh, at other times it would be a, a longer period which we would refer to as a camp. And you had to do so many of these over a period of so many years and, um, uh, and then that obligation would then be fulfilled. And once that's been done, you would then go to what they would regard as a reserve battalion. If you lived in, in Salisbury, uh, I, would, I went from 1RRR uh, to 5RR. So, um, and there you would stay until I think you were 35 years old and then you would move to an army reserve. And I'm not too sure what, what happens there. I think the, the duration and the frequency of the call-ups were, were much less. However, I was due to um, retire from 5RR, I was approaching 35, but I would have stayed on. And that wouldn't have been a problem, I would have just have to 
inform the orderly room that uh, I'm not moving on to the Army Reserve and they would have been quite happy to keep me there or anybody else for that matter. So um, that was the, the sort of rough organization of the call-up system, if I can put it that way. But in actual fact, in reality, it didn't work like that. 5RR uh, was as much a frontline battalion as 1RR was, or for that matter, as any other regiment or any other uh, unit was, because the war had got to the point where these, these distinctions didn't matter anymore. And um, the commitment really was, for all intents and purposes, six weeks in, six weeks out, six weeks in, six weeks out, and that was the end of the story. Um, and I think that would is probably what most territorial soldiers will tell you. I think they would agree with me that that is how they remembered the situation. Um, whether uh, anybody else experienced it differently, I'm not sure. But uh, that was uh, the way I remember it. Six weeks in Civvy Street, doing your work, looking after your family, you know, doing what every other civilian does, and then six weeks as a soldier. I recently read Timothy Bax's memoir, Three Sips of Gin, about his time in the RLI and the Sulu Scouts. Have you ever heard of this book or even read it? If so, do you think it's an accurate portrayal of the Rhodesian Bush War? Uh, well, sir, let me say I have not read it, and I suppose, somewhat to my shame, I, I have not even heard of it. Um, but knowing full well that I couldn't sit in front of the camera and, and say that to you and then move on to the next question, I, I thought I'd better just do a little bit of research. And so I tried to find out something about this book, and I looked at a couple of reviews. I found them quite contradictory. Um, one was um, quite uh, praiseworthy, and the other one was really not so good. And it seems to me that the major criticism that I came across was that it was there was not sufficient detail given about the the war itself. Look, I just got to say that <clears throat> when John Van Zayl and I sit down and we talk and, and we have a time of fellowship together, we will talk about the army, yes, but but our conversation doesn't include all the gore and the blood and all the rest of it and stuff like that. So we've all seen enough of that and we don't need a hop on it and we, we don't talk about it. And you'll notice that on this 5RR channel too, I, I avoid that kind of thing. It's, I don't believe that it is edifying in any way to keep talking about that. Whether the reviewer of Tim Bax's book was looking for that sort of thing and didn't find it, um, that might be one thing. But for me as a soldier, I, I would understand Tim's uh, approach if that's what it was. Uh, however, I, um, I have heard other folk uh, talk about Tim, uh, most notably perhaps Dale Collett. Now, uh, Dale Collett I met on one or two occasions um, when he would uh, come and, um, you know, talk to us prior to mobilization. He was actually just on a recruiting drive uh, for the Sulu Scouts and uh, he'd come and talk a little bit about tracking and some of the things that they'd done in their experiences and uh, quite honestly to me I, I thought he was hoping that somebody would you know perhaps speak to him afterwards and say look you know I'm a bit interested what do I have to do to join your unit it was that kind of a contact that I had with him but he is a man with an enormous uh, reputation he is a man of integrity, a man that is greatly admired. Now he talks about Tim Bax, and in the way that he talks about him, it I rather take it as an endorsement uh, of, of Tim Bax and, and this, the time that he spent in the Sulu Scouts, certainly with Dale. Through this 5RR channel, I, I have also uh, met up with um, yet another Sulu Scout and we have become, uh, if I may be allowed to say so, very good friends. We are in contact with each other almost on a daily basis. He's a man that I greatly admire. Um, and, and he also, in the way that he refers to Tim Bax, I take as an endorsement 
um, of the soldier. So, yes, I would say that um, probably what Tim has um, said to you there uh, is an honest reflection of his experiences. But when you ask me, is this um, a sort of an accurate reflection of the Rhodesian Bush War? Now, now yeah, it's very difficult for me to answer. If you were, uh, if you were to say to me, <clears throat> what is... What is my understanding of Rhodesian bush warfare? You know, in, in a few sentences. For me, it was long, hot days, um, slogging away, following tracks, um, with a heat so intense that, you know, it feels as though it sears your lungs. You are so tired that your the blood is throbbing in your temples. When I have sometimes taken my pulse, it's been up to like about 180 and goodness knows for how long it's been at that. And you just, it's just hour after hour after hour with insects buzzing around your head. At the same time, you're watching the trees. You're trying to, to watch the position of your men. It's, it's, it's a mental strain. It's a physical strain. And it's punctuated every now and then by fleeting contacts with the enemy where uh, suddenly you're in a situation where you have to protect yourself, protect your men, and you have to kill the enemy. And then everything, sort of, the cycle repeats itself again. And that is my understanding of bush warfare. However, in that very same year, let me tell you what I have learned since then, because th that I did for something like, you know, three years. And, uh, and, I, and if you'd pushed me in a corner, I would have uh, probably said to you, well, I suppose everybody's doing that, whether they're up in Hondi Valley or whether they, they're down somewhere on the Botswana border, I, I, because that's, that was my experience of the war. But during that same war, there would be other units who would be doing things like walking around the bush at night with tame lions and leaving tracks and sitting on top of gomos, that's hills, with public address systems playing recordings of lions roaring at night and and driving the terrorists out of one area after the other by using those methods. Now, this is absolutely genuine. And how cool is that? And in that same bush war, there'd be people, as uh, another gentleman that I've recently met, also through this channel, and he has shared this on, uh, on John Van Zale's channel, how that they, they built two armoured cars that were used by the Botswana Defence Force crossed over into that country and captured the entire Zipra garrison at Francistown without a shot being fired and conveyed these prisoners back across the border in, into Rhodesia. So for all of us, that was what the Bush War represented. Um, so it is it is very difficult for me if I was to take Tim Bax's book and look at it and say, oh, well, this represents a typical scene of the Rhodesian Bush Four. It may be for him, but it very well may not be for me. Um, so I would say uh, give Tim the benefit of the doubt. Uh, enjoy the book. And um, I, I hope that what I've said, uh, my comments such as they are, uh, may have been of some help to you. I'm curious about the kit that you carried in the bush, such as what kind of web gear, what sort of provisions and so forth. Also, as mentioned in your previous video, how often did you use the Browning automatic shotgun and how effective was it in the bush compared to the ever prevalent FN rifle? Well, if I may uh, start with the second part of that question, um, and that regards the automatic shotgun. I liked it. I liked the Browning. It was nice and light and comfortable, and um, I did not mind carrying it at all. I only ever fired it once in a contact, and um, perhaps if the range had been closer, I may have been able to report a little bit more accurately on uh, how effectively uh, I found it to be. But um, I stopped using it, uh, in fact, right after that contact, and I'll tell you why, that underneath this weapon, there's a, a sort of a spring-loaded flap, and um, the leading edge of this flap is, is quite sharp, and, th and that is where it closes off um, against the, 
the opening of the, the tube magazine, if I can put it to you that way. Perhaps if you had a weapon in front of you, you'd look and see what, uh, what I was talking about. And I found that when I was in a bit of a hurry and, and putting uh, shells, loading shells into this, this tube, it occurred to me that if I wasn't careful, that that flap would um, lodge itself underneath uh, my thumbnail and that I would actually stand the risk of pulling that nail off if I pulled my finger out of the weapon too quickly. So it, it, I suppose with care that would not have happened, but it seemed to me, and I mean I did look at this and think about it quite a lot, it seemed to me that if, if I was in a bit of a panic and in a bit of a rush, as one might well be in a contact situation, uh, that I could end up injuring myself. And so, purely for that reason, I started uh, leaving the, the shotgun at home. I didn't, um, I didn't bother with it. I reverted back to my trusty uh, R1 rifle. Uh, as regards kit, um, the webbing we were issued with is known as a Pattern 70. If you look on the internet, you'll find uh, plenty of photographs of it. South African designed, very good, very strong, durable stuff, nothing wrong with it. I tended to cut off any extraneous buckles that I found on it just to try and lighten it a little. But in the end, I just uh, stopped using it altogether in favour of a patrol jacket made by a civilian company called James North in Salisbury. And I found this to be far superior to the webbing that we'd been issued by the army. And um, I, I used that for the rest of my time in the Rhodesian army. Um, it uh, had pouches, sufficient pouches, many pouches, to uh, carry the, the magazines for my R1. Being a stick leader, it had a, a place on the back where I could put the radio in with a spare battery and um, the other accessories that went along with the radio. Uh, immediately beneath that pack were uh, a set of buckles to which I could um, attach my sleeping bag. On either side of this patrol jacket was uh, pouches, two of them to contain water bottles. And um, in this patrol jacket I carried all my navigation equipment as well. And that would be maps, prismatic compass, uh, protractor, pencil, and you know, all the, the sort of drawing equipment that I would need, plus a notebook. I also carried a white phosphorus grenade and a, a candle smoke uh, canister. So if I needed to mark my position for the chopper pilot, I could just toss this out and uh, we'd have a nice uh, plume of smoke there, seen visible from, from far away. Um, I carried also a what we called a pen light projector, which was uh, something about the size of a fountain pen, also locally produced there, um, out of aluminium. It had a, a sort of a sliding uh, button on the side of it, and you could screw a flare onto the end of it and hold this up into the air and um, let this little button go, and it would discharge a flare up into the sky, and you could use that for signaling purposes too. So that was quite useful. And then um, I'd have some uh, Sosogon with me. And this was a, a pain relieving uh, vial that we carried. Um, and it was injected into a person. It was uh, used in place of morphine uh, because it didn't have the side effects and it was easier for you know a non-trained medical person to, to use. Um, Within the stick, there would be other items of equipment, things that one soldier wouldn't need for himself, like uh, binos. We didn't have four pairs of binos in the stick. Somebody would carry the binoculars, and these would be uh, a pair of 8x40 rubber encased uh, um, opticals, very good, uh, well produced, so somebody would be carrying that. There'd be a claymore, claymore wire, other means of detonation, perhaps. Uh, extra magazines for the MAG gunner. Um, rifle grenades, somebody would probably carry maybe up to four rifle grenades, which were always uh, very useful in certain situations. Um, a drip or two extra. 
if we weren't carrying a shock pack, which was a sort of a medical pack which somebody might might carry as well. Um, yeah, so that was uh, the sort of stuff that we would carry. As far as provisions go, look, some soldiers just pack their, <laughs> their old ration pack up and, you know, or two or more even, uh, and they don't go short of food while they're in the bush. Um, I couldn't be bothered with that because of the extra weight. I was quite fastidious about making sure that I I carried as little as possible so that my work would be that much easier. So in the morning, uh, I'd get up and have a big breakfast, um, and then I would wait until we were called out. And as a routine, this would normally happen before about 10 o'clock. There'd be an alarm given somewhere that terrorists were either spotted or there was a report that they had fed at a village the previous evening. And so we would be dispatched to where the spoor began and then we would start the follow-up. So uh, I didn't need to carry any food for that first day. I did have a small tin of uh, bully beef which I uh, put in my my pack and it was there in case I needed it. So I could go that first day. Hopefully if all turned out well we would be picked up and brought back to base by the evening and then I could have another meal again. But if it so happened that we had to sleep on the spoor, that's also okay. It doesn't bother me. Uh, we can continue the next day. We can continue till about maybe four o'clock in the afternoon. If it looked to me like we were still going to uh, be a while uh, tracking these gooks, uh, then I would open that tin of bully beef and I would have that. And that so that would be uh, on the second day. If we slept on the spoor again that night, that's fine. The next day. I would go until we were picked up because it was very unlikely that we would actually stay out more than two nights on a set of tracks. It, if we haven't caught them by that time or brought the thing to some sort of conclusion, then um, you know it would be better to go back to base and wait for a fresh sighting or a fresh feeding report and then start again and hopefully have better luck. So two nights out, oh, that's, that's quite a lot on the follow-up. And then when we got back, uh, on that uh, that day, I would have a big meal as soon as we arrived there. So I was okay, you know. Uh, small tin of bully beef would keep me going for three days, as it were. Uh, water, I tended to just carry the one water bottle when I was on follow-ups, especially if it was during the rainy season, because there'd always be pools of water somewhere that you'd come across, and uh, you know, just put your water bottle in there and, and recharge it. Um, we were given tablets, <coughs> you put the one in and it kills everything that's harmful to you in the water, whatever it might be, it left a terrible chlorine taste and the other tablet was supposed to take that away and make the water more palatable. But uh, for those of us who, who, who did use water purifying tablets, chlorine tablet was good enough, it tasted like a swimming pool but never mind, uh, you could drink it and it, it didn't do you any harm. Um, I don't know that there's very much more that I can tell you uh, as far as our, our clothing is concerned. We would um, uh, have on a pair of uh, PT shorts, um, camouflage t-shirt, in my case the t-shirts that I wore again were not military issue, they came from a civilian company and I think their name was Thunderman. And, um, and I'd have my combat cap which was a government issue. And inside it was um, a plastic um, day glow disc. And the idea being that if we were in a contact and the chopper uh, pilot was unable to discern who were gooks and who was uh, friendly forces, we would turn these caps inside out and put them back on again. And uh, from the air, uh, he would be able to see these orange patches in the bush and uh, hopefully not pull us. Uh, footwear. Well, the army, of course, issued some very heavy, <laughs> good quality boots that you could, you know, cross the world with if you wanted to, to do that sort of thing. Um, but we opted uh, rather for um, softer civilian type shoes. Well, we called them tackies. And um, they were, what, what do you call them, sneakers, tennis shoes, I suppose. I don't know how else I can describe them. Some of the, the famous brands that we preferred. North Stars, Super Pros, uh, and then of course we also very much uh, liked wearing felt scones. 
And there's a pair here somewhere. I'm sorry that I didn't get them out so I could show you what I'm talking about. They, yeah, they battered and they're much the worse for wear, but, but they come from that era. And these were very popular. Um, and they were worn by most troopies, I would say. So I, I hope that is, um, you know, covered everything that you asked for there regarding the kit and what we used. Um, and thank you very much for that question. I'd love to know what rations you took out with you and what you ate at base. Was it typical British food or more Africanized? This is a great question. I have seen this come up time and time again, where folk are very curious as to, as to what we ate. And uh, if you can indulge me, I would, uh, I would like to actually devote a, a whole video to this subject at a later stage. And um, I'll explain to you exactly what it was uh, that we ate and, uh, and how we prepared it. So uh, if, if it's okay with you, we'll get back to this one. But thank you very much for that question. Now here's a rather interesting question. What was your opinion on the Grey Scouts? And did you ever encounter them in the field? <laughs> well, I think I need to preface my reply by telling you about a follow-up that I once went on. A group of terrorists had robbed a store and um, they had, you know, laden themselves up with cool drinks and sweets and all sorts of other provisions and there they set off uh, to make their getaway. And they did so along a quite a well-defined road. A couple of kilometers away from the store, they uh, took off their, their boots and uh, started walking in their stocking feet. And they must have thought that this was uh, a sufficient measure to confuse us and to uh, make us uh, lose the trail. Well, of course, it did nothing of the kind. We followed them as easily in their stocking feet as, as, as we would have had they kept their, their boots on. Uh, at any rate, as we proceeded along this, down this road, I got a, a call from our platoon base uh, informing me that uh, we would be getting help in the form of a BSAP mounted unit uh, known as call sign Foxtrot X-Ray. And this was of uh, great interest to me. I uh, had never before worked with uh, mounted troops and I was uh, very curious to see how this was going to work out. And so we just kept on walking, waiting for these uh, policemen to catch up with us, uh, which they did eventually. And I had been watching down the road as we, as we were proceeding. And uh, on one occasion, as I turned and looked over my shoulder, I saw them coming in the distance. And uh, as they got closer, you know, I can still see this in front of my mind today. <clears throat> I actually stopped the follow-up and I just paused to wait for these, uh, these men to catch up with us. It was like a scene from a John Wayne movie with the 7th Cavalry uh, coming down the road. And I looked at it and I said to myself, take a good look, because this is probably one of the last times in modern warfare that you will ever see mounted infantry. And um, and they came jogging up to where we were. Uh, yes, it was, uh, f for me, it was something that was quite significant, I thought. And so we set off uh, after these gooks. And when they had left the road, they'd gone and put their boots back on again. And then it was <laughs> that we lost the trail, can you believe it? <clears throat> um, but we would find them, we knew that. In, in fact, we were the trackers and I were talking and, and one of them said to me let's just stop moving forward and hunting for spoor here doing 360s see that feature over there let's climb up on that feature and we just sit there quietly and just just watch the countryside they yes somewhere they're gonna have to move and when they move we'll see where they are and then we can just get at them and while we were still having this uh, conversation the, the policemen decided that they would go off uh, on their own and they went off onto our right flank how many were there? I'm trying to remember now. I'd say, I don't know, how big was that call sign? Probably about eight horses, eight or ten, maybe, I think. Anyway, they, they disappeared into the bush and started cross-graining there, seeing if they could pick up the spoor. And then an almighty contact broke out. 
um, they run into the groups while we're still standing there talking and thinking about what to do next. So there's gunfire and uh, we quickly form up and we sweep in that direction, uh, but it's too late by the time we get there. Uh, the gooks have bolted in one direction <laughs> and the, the horses in the other. Now the men dismounted as soon as the contact was initiated and uh, I mean I didn't ask. There, there are times when it is polite not to ask too many questions but uh, I, I assume somebody must have been told you hold the horses while we deal with the gooks and the horses were not dealt with properly because they took off and they headed back to wherever they had, they had come from. They disappeared, leaving these men afoot. So uh, the trucks eventually came and picked them up. And I heard later that, no, there was no problem with the horses. They, they knew where to go and they went back home. Now, the, the reason why I'm, I'm telling you all this is because, no, I never encountered the Grey Scouts per se in the field. So I had nothing to do with them. But 5RR was a very strange place. I mean you would find people from all sorts of units in 5RR. Our company commander was ex-SAS. We had a sergeant major uh, at one time, our CSM, was ex-SAS, uh, Bronze Cross as well. An interesting story that he had to tell as well, but he needs to tell it himself. Um, and then RLI, I mean, we had a, a liberal sprinkling of RLI, ex-RLI troops amongst us, uh, you know, and and so it was with, with other units as well. And we had one man from Grey Scouts. Now, I don't know how he ended up with us, but he was no longer with Grey Scouts. He was now with 5RR. But he was the most entertaining fellow that you could ever encounter. And, you know, when he spoke, everybody just fell silent and we just listened. And <laughs> he was an, a very interesting and an amusing talker. And uh, he would tell us of what life was like in the Grey Scouts. Now, <laughs> this comes to you like third hand, what I'm saying now. So I can't tell you that this is exactly how things were done there. I can only tell you that this is exactly what I heard this man say to me. And um, he didn't talk much about their combat experience. Uh, we can all, you know, look on the Internet and find here and there. Uh, you know accounts of that I think John may even have interviewed somebody as well uh, from that unit at any rate this guy tells us most of their time was spent at loggerheads with Department of uh, National Parks and Wildlife and they according to him they spent a lot of their time like poaching game and uh, you know making biltong and augmenting their rations <laughs> with this uh, with this uh, game that they were shooting and uh, to them I suppose it didn't seem anything wrong after all you're in the middle of a war are you still really seriously worried about game preservation in a situation like that so there was a a, a, a lot of stories from him about hunts that they'd been on and, and game that they'd shot and how they took this meat back to their, their camp and so on and the other thing that was interesting uh, was explaining as he explained to us how the horses were trained now I don't know if horses a couple of hundred years ago were made of sterner stuff or what I mean you see paintings of horses charging in the Napoleonic Wars and uh, you know they seem to be quite brave beasts but it seems like the modern horses and of course Rhodesia can hardly be called modern but at that time it was modern for us they uh, seem to be particularly gun shy and he says they overcame this by, by taking a horse onto the firing line and discharging a weapon some distance away from it. And the horse would tremble and st stamp his feet and they'd come a bit closer each time discharging a, uh, the rifle, trying to get him to be used to it. Uh, and eventually the horse would become accustomed. Uh, but some horses, no. They didn't like the noise and they didn't like uh, any guns near them. Now that's that's not a good situation if you're supposed to be a horse in the Grey Scouts and you're scared of guns. That's not going to work. So they had a, something that they put a, over the horse with a buckle on the end of it and they'd tie a block of concrete underneath him uh, and he'd be secured to the firing line and 
where they fired the weapon too close to him and he got anxious and started kicking and jumping around. He couldn't go anywhere because he was tethered to this, uh, this lump of concrete. And, uh, and eventually the soldier would be able to mount him and fire the weapon from, uh, from the saddle and the horse would stand comparatively still. So the horse was now broken into the sound of gunfire. But with some animals that only lasted for the day. The next morning, the minute the weapon was discharged near him, <laughs> he went berserk and the whole process had to be started again. In some cases, he tells me that without any success at all, you know, the horse just wasn't fit for military service. This is what I hear from, from our friend there in, in 5RR. But the most amusing account he had for us was uh, when they were on patrol and, and his horse died. It just died lay down and uh, just didn't get up again. So they stripped whatever kit they could off this horse and, uh, you know, he had to get on the back of another horse and so they had to finish the patrol and, and go back to the base camp. Whereupon he was asked, where's, where's your mount? He said, the horse died. He said, well, how do we know the horse died? And he said, well, what else would I have done with the horse? Why wouldn't I bring it back? He said, well, maybe you sold it to some local. So how can you say I sold my horse to the local? You know, I've got my, my buddies here with me. Oh, no, we can't trust them either. So uh, the long and the short of the story was that apparently on the, the horse's hooves, there is a brand with his service number. And uh, before the horse can be, you know, sort of written off in the books, somebody's got to uh, verify that that, that, that that number has come back. So they were sent back to the scene of the dead horse to go and remove this hoof. And when they arrived there, everybody thought that somebody else would have brought a, a panga with them, a machete, to, to hack this, this hoof off. But nobody had. He said, so there we had this uh, very unpleasant task of trying to shoot this, uh, this hoof off the, the horse, which they eventually did and brought this grizzly thing back to base. And that was accepted and the horse's service record was terminated accordingly. So I have I have nothing to tell you about their tactics and how they proceeded into contacts and how they they fired from uh, the saddle and, and killed the gooks or anything like that. All I know is that they did do that sort of thing and they were a very highly regarded unit and I would dearly love somebody from the Grey Scouts to please comment and just Tell us a little bit, something a little bit more substantial about that unit. Because they're very famous and a very old unit too, with a very illustrious and glorious history back in the early uh, times of Rhodesian history. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> did I meet any Grey Scouts? No, apart from our colleague there, the great storyteller. And um, you know, my opinion of them certainly is, uh, like I said, of the armoured cars, a, a very high opinion. Very, very interesting uh, uh, unit, interesting concept to mounted infantry. Okay, next question. Can you give briefly the battle you won't forget or you were defeated, please? Um, okay, I was never in any battles. For the most part, our engagements with the enemy were short, sharp skirmishes that lasted in some cases, in most cases, uh, mere seconds. Um, but I understand um, what you're getting at. Uh, were we ever defeated? No, we were never defeated. Uh, that never happened. In every instance, every contact that I was in, the enemy gave way. And, and gave way, in my opinion, in many cases, when they should have stood their ground a little bit more firmly. So there was never a question of, uh, of being defeated. It never came into my mind, ever that we might be in a situation where we got to start stepping backwards and uh, giving way to them. Um, uh, no, it was never a consideration. And I think that um, many of the Rhodesian units would, would say the same. Um, the battle I won't forget. Um, you know, what for me was most satisfying was... Um, Look, I understand that a soldier's job is to kill the enemy, and when that is done, you know, he, he should be, you know, 
very happy with uh, his results. Uh, but I found that with myself, I was happiest when I had been able to outfigure the enemy. That gave me immense satisfaction. So um, the one that stands out in my mind was a, an incident where a group of terrorists were wandering around in an area. I don't know what it was that made them stay there. They were actually transiting through the, the, the place. They were going from one place to another. And I don't know if they got lost or what, and um, but, but they kept milling around and they would sit for a few days on one hilltop and then a few days on another and then somewhere else. And of course this came to the attention of the authorities that these people were swanning around the area and we were sent there to try and uh, uh, deal with them. So uh, the chopper landed us there and I had uh, an evening to sit and think about it and to look at all the information that we had uh, got so far. And I tried to see if there was some pattern to the movement of these terrorists. And eventually I, I had some sort of an idea of where they would be going, but it was just, you know, a vague hunch, if you can put it that way, but founded on a, on a lot of thinking. Um, so the next morning I went off uh, with my call sign and I was fortunate that I had a, a, another call sign as well at my disposal who I sent off in another direction because that seemed to be where the gooks were heading but I didn't think that they would go there. And when I got a report later on in the day that no tracks had been sighted by that other call sign I knew that I would probably find them and uh, sure enough I cut across this spur a little bit quicker than I thought I would have. But yes, uh, almost exactly where I anticipated that they would be. And um, what made it uh, even more satisfying for me was that my trackers, who were from National Parks and Wildlife at that time, um, very good, experienced European men, uh, actually argued a little bit with me and said that uh, uh, this was old spoor and we were wasting uh, our time but I was a little bit insistent and they indulged me and it wasn't long after that that we came across these these terrorists and uh, we were able to deal with them and so that is the one contact that sticks in my mind um, uh, not so much because of the kills uh, that we got but because I had been able to you know in my mind uh, outfigure the gook leader so um yeah he was out generaled <laughs> so i enjoyed that very much um yeah i don't know if that if that answers your question in any way but um yeah that was a good day that certainly was thank you for that by the way we have a rather long question yeah and um we don't have all of it up on our poster but perhaps you can just uh, follow as i read it out to you the history of your nation and your people is often co-opted by extremist groups in my home country. Modern Marxists will look solely through the lens of anti-colonialism and anti-capitalism and argue that your nation deserved to be destroyed. Conversely, modern white supremacist groups will say that Mugabe's deception, the communists' cruelty and economic incompetence typify the African race. My question is this. How would you respond to both of these political wings? The Marxists, who accept the demonized version of your nation's history, and the supremacists that use a racialized version of Rhodesian history to corroborate their narrative? Well, that's a pretty complex question, I think, for someone like me to answer. Well, I think it would probably need a political scientist to do justice to any reply. But I'll try and respond, sir. Uh, forgive me if my reply is not very objective. But let's just deal with the uh, capitalistic aspect of this, uh, of this matter. You see, I believe that if you take an individual and you remove all constraints from him, whatever they might be, whether they are legal, political, cultural, religious, or whatever, take all those constraints away. And then you say to him, you are free, go away and take care of yourself. He will lapse into some form of capitalism because he is obeying his natural instincts. 
So that's the way I see it. On the other hand, if you want to turn a man into a communist, you have to use, in the first instance, powers of persuasion. You have to reason with him, get him to change his mind, get him to change his natural instincts, and become a communist. If you cannot succeed in that, all that's left to you is coercion and compulsion. You need to compel him at gunpoint if necessary to see the universe in the way that you see it. And that is exactly what happened in Rhodesia during the Bush War. We all witnessed this. We all read about it. Sometimes it was splashed on our newspapers. And sometimes we would see it for ourselves on the television screens. The cruelty that the communists employed in order to intimidate the nation and to get them to go along with the aims and the ideals of a, a communist state. So communism, Marxism, is nothing that you can hold up and ask people to aspire to or expect them to do that um, with its terrible track record. Today still, look at North Korea, very decidedly a communist country. And what do you see? The elite, the leaders, living the most opulent lives. And the rest of the population, we are told, existing in abject poverty. That's communism. And the fact is that there's actually nothing to it. It's just a lot of talk. It's, it's a smokescreen. It doesn't ring true. There's no substance to it. It's like standing on quicksand. It trickles through your fingers. It has nothing except words, 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 backed up by cruelty and force. So I've got nothing to say to the Marxists. If you're unhappy about colonialism, well, you're unhappy about a lot of stuff. I feel rocks for you. As for the white supremacists that uh, you have referred to, sir, uh, and I'm, I'm sure you do mean this, that there's, they are not just white supremacists, they are black supremacists. They are supremacists, I suppose, from every nation on earth. People who look at others and say, hey, that guy's not the same color that I am. So I will, you know, I will be aggressive toward him. I will be rude toward him. I will hate him. And uh, if necessary, if I feel strongly enough about it, I will kill him simply because he, he is not the same race that I am. Anybody who views the world like that ought to know that is not a Rhodesian thing. We never stood for anything like that. We can't endorse anybody who sees the world in that way. I mean, I have read of a young man who took a Rhodesian flag, sewed it on his t-shirt, I believe, went into a church, blasted away at some people that weren't the same race as his. That's got nothing to do with Rhodesia. That, uh, he never found that example uh, with us. We don't subscribe to that, court, that kind of thing at all. Let me just uh, say on a personal note that uh, my grandmother, as a child, grew up on a farm here in South Africa. And at that time, there was a terrible war going on known as the Anglo-Boer War. And uh, the men were away fighting. <clears throat> The women were left alone on the farms, and in this case it was my great-grandmother, an old lady, and all these children. And um, the British had decided on a policy of scorched earth. And they were going to travel around the countryside, far and wide, um, arresting anybody that they found on the farms, throwing them into concentration camps, where a great many of them perished and died. A terrible chapter in the history of South Africa and if you have time and the inclination and you start researching into it you'll be horrified at the things that went on. Things done by a so-called so supposedly civilized nation against other people. Women and children sent to their deaths in these concentration camps. Uh, and then the farms would be destroyed after the inhabitants had been arrested. The livestock, uh, likewise, would be destroyed. Sometimes uh, the British would um, try and save ammunition 
and they'd herd the, the animals together into a barn and just simply set it alight and let them let them burn to death. I mean, it was cheaper than, than shooting, shooting, shooting them. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, these times were very difficult, fearful times. And on a particular day, the cry went up at this farmhouse where my grandmother grew up, that the Kakis are here. And the Kakis were the, the name that the Afrikaners gave to the British troops on account of the colour of their uniform. The Kakis are here. So my great grandmother, an old lady, uh, grabbed her children, ran out the back door. The men were all away fighting. No men folk on the farm. On the farm. Uh, threw a, ran through an orchard, uh, across a field, and into a hill that stood uh, a little distance away from the dwellings. And there they watched as the livestock were, were destroyed, and the building set alight, and the soldiers rode off. So here was this uh, family, old woman, surrounded by a number of children, destitute, uh, in the bush, with no one to look after them. But what do you think happened? Um, the black people in that area sought them out uh, because they had seen that the soldiers had ridden off without any captives. Found this family, brought them food and cared for them, which was against the law. Proclamation had been made that uh, the black people were supposed to report incidences where whites had uh, escaped from the clutches of the, the British troops. Uh, and, and in this way uh, allow the soldiers to go and round these people up. But they didn't do that. At great risk to themselves, they brought food to that family. And so here I am today. I'm sitting in front of the camera and I'm talking about Rhodesia and, and I'm talking about the subject. And, uh, and I am here because black people, people who are not the same color as I am, looked after my ancestors. And um, if you were to think for a minute and say to yourself, well, those so-and-so British, you know, they're an awful bunch. Let me just continue. That subsequently, a patrol scouring the hillsides did come across the small family that had been cared for and was being cared for by the black people. Now, at the risk of being court-martialed, these men then took their rations and left it there with my great-grandmother to feed her children. And they set off and didn't say a word. And they came back periodically whenever they had an excuse to, to, to take their small patrol up into those hills, sought out the family and gave them more food and looked after them. So we had blacks on the one side, despised uh, today in the eyes of uh, the white supremacists, who were kind enough to look after a white family who had no means of repaying them, or, or, or doing anything. We had British soldiers who just illustrated the point that there is good and bad in every nation, who at great risk to themselves looked after that family. So I have learned that when I reflect upon these things to modify my comments. For my own self, serving in the Rhodesian army, and I need to remind everybody that that army was predominantly black. And I, especially the, the last year of my service there, I was one European in a stick of three others, and they were all black. And I put my head down every night and went to sleep, never with the thought that I was unsafe. Never did I ever feel that one of these guys could just pull me during the night and take me out. I never felt that. I felt safe with them because they were taking care of me and I was taking care of them as their stick leader. So I think that is typical of the Rhodesian soldier. They will all say that to you. Um, it never was a race war. It had nothing to do with race. So if anybody wants today to use Rhodesia as an example, I am happy for you. I, 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 I wish you would. But don't use it in the sense that this gives me a reason to discriminate against other people on the grounds of race. No, that's, we never stood 
for anything like that. And as for what's going on in Zimbabwe today, if I could just, you know, just very briefly make a comment. <clears throat> I, I know what people are saying. I mean, we hear this all the time. I haven't been there for a while. I can't speak uh, first-hand knowledge. But I certainly hear how bad things are there. They're not as good as they once were, put it that way. And uh, it is not... It is not the whole story to simply point a finger and say, you see, that is um, that is what the black people are like. That is our excuse for behaving toward them in the way that we do. Uh, look what they've done to that country. Look at the mess it's in now. Yes, it is in a mess. Uh, we accept that. It's not what it used to be. Uh, and yes, there are black people who are in charge there. But bear in mind... Okay, that it's Zanu PF that's in charge. And if you were to ask me, and perhaps you think I'm naive, well, so be it. But if you were to ask me, I would say the day that that government falls or somehow comes to an end and freedom returns to that land, you will see a big change taking place there. Honestly, I really do believe that. I believe that the Zimbabwe people are capable of much more than what we see there now. So um, I don't think that is a valid um, argument to say, look what's going on there. Uh, therefore, I, I will hate other people that uh, are not the same color as I am. Sorry, I don't want to start waffling. Um, uh, but I think that is the best I can do with this question. It, it is a complicated question, very important question. But as a Rhodesian, my final word is, don't use us if you want to go around hating other people. That's not what we stood for. Thank you for the question. Last question on this list. Do you plan on visiting a shooting range? We'd love to see you shooting an FN. Uh, oh, uh, no, I'm not planning on, on visiting a shooting range. I'd also love to bang away a few rounds with an FN. I used to go with the Cape Town Highlanders when I first moved here from Rhodesia. Uh, the RSM there was a friend of mine and he, he'd invite me along. So I, I still got in a bit of shooting and um, I spent some time there amongst uh, soldiers. But of course, <laughs> I was an outsider and a civilian. Um, no, I, I don't know how I would possibly do that. I don't know anybody with an, with an FN. Um, I don't know how I'd be able to do that, but but thank you for the question. Maybe one day uh, I'll set up some targets and take a paintball paintball gun and, and fire that and, and, and record it. <laughs> uh, thank you, sir. Sorry, I, I I'm not able to do that. Uh, just in closing, I have something here that I'd like to share with you. I was at my good friend uh, Hudson Chalmers's home the other day. And he said, Martin, uh, uh, don't you want to take us with and uh, flip through it, uh, read it. It's very interesting. Uh, and if you want to uh, say a few words on your channel. And so I, I, I picked up a book on his table and I, I brought it home with me. It's uh, called Chopper Tech and it's uh, written by uh, quite a well-known uh, gentleman by the name of Beaver Shaw. Now, John has already interviewed him and John has covered quite a bit of the contents of this book. So I'm not, I'm not going to go into that. All, you know, let me just tell you that um, I, I took it home and um, I didn't have much time. So I thought, well, I'll just, you know, just turn a couple of pages here and there and see what it's about. But, uh, you know, I, I had it down open on the bed beside me. And uh, I'd had my dinner and uh, I kept reminding myself, you've got to put this thing down now. It's, it's getting late and tomorrow there's a lot of stuff you have to attend to. And I turn another page and I turn another page and I turn another page. And um, I, 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 I really could not put this book away. In fact, I fell asleep with the light still on and I woke up at some point during the night to find the light burning. The book's still open and my hand across some page where I must have been reading something. Now, let me tell you, there's a, there's a lot of very, very good stuff about the Rhodesian War in here that you'd never find anywhere else. If you're really interested and, and, and you, you know, you owe yourself a favor, get this book, man. 
it's also in, interspersed with a lot of a, a lot of other information. For example, did you know that there are more helicopters at the bottom of the sea than there are submarines in the sky? <laughs> Well, that's something I read in this book and a lot of other stuff like that, too. There are poems in here. There are some beautiful drawings. This man is an artist as well. There's, uh, there's stuff about his family. There's stuff about life in Rhodesia. Uh, it really is a wonderful window into what things were like in those days. Um, go on the Internet. I'm sure you'll find there how you can uh, order it. Um, but it's a beautiful book. Let me just hold it up for you once more again. Chopper Tech by Beaver Shaw. Fantastic. Hudson, thank you for letting me read it. Okay, I think we'll, we'll stop there. Uh, we've got through quite a bit. Um, uh, folks, I just want to say something. That um, one thing that I've learned through this channel is that there are a lot of knowledgeable people out there. And very often when I've not been able to provide sufficient detail, uh, folk have provided comments, um, supplying missing information or a bit of extra information, um, which is very helpful uh, in all of us understanding um, the subject. So I, th I thank you for that. I've learned a lot and I'm sure we all have. So please keep doing that. Um, if you have something that you would like to share, please post it. Uh, we're all learning. So uh, thank you for that. And um, well, I, I think let's, um, let's call it a day. We've, uh, you've listened long enough to me speaking. So um, let's just um, wrap it up here. Uh, folks, thank you again for everything. I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Uh, keep well, uh, take care. And until we meet again, cheers.